references to a very highly developed civilization that used to exist on the earth far back in the past can be found in the ancient legends and fables of different nations. Our remote ancestors called representatives of this civilization gods. God's capacities surpassed human capacities by far. So, the lives of our ancestors were subordinated to the will of powerful gods. Gods established the rules that govern social relations and determine the procedure for the human service of the gods. However, the gods not only ruled the people, they provided people with knowledge in medicine and astronomy, they taught people crop farming, livestock husbandry, clergy, and pottery. In essence, the entire human civilization was created by gods. Modern academic science classifies the ancient legends and fables as myths, regarding them as fabrications and fantasies of our ancient ancestors. Historians negate a highly developed civilization of gods in the past blankly. Moreover, even discussion of this subject is strictly prohibited among professional historians. Everybody who mentions the god civilization, even as a working hypothesis, jeopardizes his or her scientific career. The situation was entirely different some 150 to 200 years ago. It was legends and fables that served as the main sources of information on the remote past. The sources viewed by historians as quite reliable for many hundreds and even thousands of years. Traces of Ancient Gods Civilization If the topic of an ancient, highly developed civilization is discussed somewhere now, it is only on internet sites and forums. In the so-called alternative books and films, the professional historians prefer ignoring. This discussion concerns Egyptian pyramids very frequently most famously the ones on the Giza Plateau. Some people try to calculate how many workers it would have taken to erect these pyramids, how much time, money, food, and other resources would have been spent on such construction. With the figures at hand, they try to prove that the Egyptians were unable to build these pyramids. Yet others, using the same figures sometimes, argue that the Egyptians were able to do that, and a highly developed civilization of some gods had nothing to do with the construction. And nobody manages to convince anybody of anything. The issue has been disputed for almost a century, and resembles the infinite run clockwise. Can this run be interrupted? We believe so. For this purpose, we should shift from figures to a very simple logical consideration. The Great Pyramid's weight is estimated at 7 to 8 million tons. The second pyramid on the plateau is a bit smaller. Taken together, the three pyramids weigh about 15 to 20 million tons. However, not only the pyramids were built of large and huge stone blocks in Egypt's antiquity. For instance, there are temples made of blocks weighing dozens and even hundreds of tons on that very Giza plateau. Their temples of stone blocks of considerable dimensions in Karnak and other Egyptian towns. There is an area of underground tombs regarded by Egyptologists as mastabas, the ancient Egyptian burial sites of the royal family and top officials. In Abydos, there is a structure called the Osiris Shrine in ancient stories that is built of thoroughly worked solid granite boulders. Megaliths, the structures made of large and huge stone blocks, occur not only in Egypt. They can be seen, for instance, in Israel, Syria, and Turkey. You can come across them in other continents, too. 
South America is an example where the scope of such construction boggled everyone's imagination. If we sum up the megaliths worldwide, their weight will number in hundreds of millions, if not billions of tons. Billions of tons of worked stone. It's virtually an industrial scale. It's quite obvious that given such a stone construction scale, nobody could work each block to the perfect state. One would even be unable to, even if he wanted to. There'd be spoilage, laws, and stones deliberately left partially worked. It means marks of the tools used to work the stones would inevitably be left on some blocks. Here's another simple logical consideration. Most people are able to easily determine what has happened to a stick or lump of wood. It's been broken with hands, axed, or cut with a knife or saw. Each tool leaves its typical trace. The same is true for the stone. One can determine by a tool trace on a stone surface the type of tool used to work the stone and each tool corresponds to the particular level of technology available to the craftsman. Circular saw traces, do you see them? Yes, I do. And here you can trace that they are parallel, right here, like this, circle-wise. And there, too. A disc grinder. Sure, a disc grinder. To illustrate, we can examine a black basil block with two entirely different mark types. These marks relate to two and entirely different levels of technology in use. One part of the block surface is obtained by ordinary material shearing with the simplest tool. For instance, a hammer and a chisel. Due to particular features on the material's crystalline structure, the surface is rather uneven, with noticeable cavities. In addition, it has grown whitish. The other part of the same block has a well-polished, darker surface, which is typical of machine processing of stone. For instance, such surface is obtained at modern stonework enterprises by cutting black basil with diamond circular saws. Shear molding on the basil block is a sign of such a circular saw. It is a protrusion of a bit more than one millimeter high which was formed in the places where the saw skewed a bit for some reason. The curved protrusion form proves the circular saw use. This basil block could be used as an illustration in stonework textbooks, but for the following circumstance. The fact is, it was found by archaeologists in Egypt, in a small satellite pyramid near Pharaoh Pepi II's pyramid that dates back almost 4,500 years ago. Historians believe machine production was not in use in the period under Pepe II, nor earlier. Ancient Egyptians had the simplest tools and technologies at their disposal. Their manifestation is the shear block part only. However, by the surface depth and this trace pattern at the boundary of the two parts, the definite conclusion can be made. The material was sheared after its machine processing. What is a circular saw for working such a solid stone as black basalt? The saw should rotate at a fairly high speed so as not to stall in the stone. This rotation should come from some device. An appropriate power supply is necessary for this purpose. ...from the friction in the working area. 
That's why modern saws are made of very durable steel grades. Stone is cut with solid diamond nozzles and the working area is cooled constantly by a water flow. The craftsmen would represent a civilization with very highly developed technologies only. A civilization comparable to the modern one could have left such traces. This black basalt block is a vivid example that the ancient, highly developed civilization was the reality, rather than fables or fantasies of our remote predecessors. This block is not the only evidence of its kind. A group of Russian enthusiasts has been looking for such ancient artifacts for 10 years already. Under the auspices of the Third Millennium Science Development Foundation, they conducted a number of expeditions to different countries of the world. The Egyptian stone traces of the machine work in high antiquity have been known for a rather long time. Sir Flinders Petrie studied them 100 years ago, having discovered them on a granite sarcophagus in the Great Pyramid. As early as then, Petrie was surprised by the trace parameters corresponding to the equipment that surpassed the then modern equipment by thousands of times. Egyptologists recognized Flinders Petrie's achievements in measuring geometrical and geodesic parameters of the pyramid. However, they maintain a wall of silence on his conclusions about the marks of instruments. One cannot find what Petri wrote on the subject in any textbooks or academic editions. So Flinders Petri has remained the first and only academic science representative who studied the issue. Meanwhile, any tourist who visits the Giza Plateau is able to see the traces of ancient machine working. Just take a closer look at the blocks that the temple floor near the Great Pyramid is made of. The archaeologists who restored that floor a century ago did it professionally. They made the stones with the traces of instruments easily accessible for study by having placed them along the perimeter. By the way, the trace runs even lower here. Can you see? They cut it like this. And then, by the way, this trace resembles the disc grinder even more. No doubt, a disc grinder was applied here. Some of these marks might have been left by a primitive saw in the case of manual sawing. The others, obviously, relate to some machinery. Many traces look just like a side effect. For instance, there's a block that a craftsman left two deep cuts on. It looks like the craftsman waved his hand with a circular saw or a conventional knife negligently, as if cutting some foam plastic. However, it is the solid black basalt, not some soft foam plastic, and it takes fixed modern machinery to leave such traces. They cut incidentally, just in passing, here and there. The point is, they made one cut, then the second cut. They did what they wanted. All traces here seem to be casual. It's strange. All of them are just made by chance. In general, all traces we saw in Peru and elsewhere look incidental. A circular saw of a bit less than 50 centimeters in diameter left its mark on a black basalt block of a temple floor near the pyramid of Uskarov in Saqqara. No restoration has ever been conducted there. Many traces of a circular saw, like a modern jet disc grinder, are on a sarcophagus in the Pyramid of Teti in Saqqara. The craftsman, by waving his hand negligently, cut off a piece after another piece from the block, as if he handled some foam plastic and not solid stone. Since the sarcophagus walls are rather curved, the craftsman seems to have been rather disinterested in the result. The same negligence manifests itself on a black basalt block in a temple near the pyramid of Nisuri in Abusir. The craftsman just notched the block and then split the stone sock. 
the notch was obviously made by one tool movement and has a variable depth. So while a modern craftsman is only able to make a notch of a couple of millimeters deep in one passage, even by straining on the disc grinder with all his weight, the notch on the block is 15 centimeters deep. That is to say, a hundred times greater. Making a notch with the subsequent splitting of a block part can be seen on the pink peripheral gate ceiling in Osiris, in that very building believed to be Osiris' shrine. The lower polished block part corresponds to machine working. If they had used a flat saw, it should have been some 10 meters long. In the case of a circular saw, its diameter should have exceeded 2 meters. Both things are almost the limit of modern technology. Machinery traces can be found not only in Egypt. There is a famous fortress of Sacsayhuaman near Cusco, the ancient capital of the Incan Empire. Its zigzag walls are made of blocks, some of which weigh over 300 tons, but are fitted almost perfectly with each other despite a very complex form of side surfaces. Opposite this zigzag wall, there's a diarrhectic rocky outlet used by local children and tourists as a natural slide. Not far from this entertainment site, we can see a small cut in the rock where a circular saw of almost 50 centimeters in diameter left several traces. Excellent traces of a round cutter. Here's one trace, here's the second, and here's even the third one. Here, I think, we can measure the cutting edge with millimeters. How wide is it? Some three millimeters? Yes, two or three millimeters. Two or three millimeters. It's very much like what we saw in Egypt and in Greece. The edge width in Greece is two to three millimeters too. There's a notch in the same rock, a bit aside. It is one or two centimeters deep and some ten odd meters long. Show me this. I'll take a picture with your finger. Here it runs. Ancient craftsmen handled stones just like we handle, for instance, tiles. We make a notch with a glass cutter and then split them. However, we're not speaking about ceramic tiles here. Somebody snipped off a piece of rock weighing about a thousand tons which still lies nearby. It is far beyond our modern capacities. There's the ancient capital of the Hittite Empire, Hattusa, in the central part of contemporary Turkey. The oldest premises of a local temple are found in a black basalt block that is virtually worked with machinery on all sides. Perfectly polished. They must have been sawing at a high speed, at great speed. It's like a mirror. Measurements of the parameters of the most distinct circular saw traces suggest that the saw was a bit less than the two meters in diameter. Our modern industry has stationary equipment with such saw. Hattusa is believed to have been founded 4,000 years ago. However, Hittite legends have it that this town emerged from the site of a much more ancient settlement. Active archaeological surveys began in the village of Alaka in Turkey not so long ago. When digging on the royal palace site, archaeologists discovered a small black basalt block notched on different sides for some reason. Through particular features of the cutting tool traces, we can unambiguously conclude a small circular saw was applied here. The ancient craftsman held it in his hands, just like we hold a modern disc grinder. It's machinery too. Here, the saw cutting shows a circular saw was used. The curve is very, rather significant. That's why. Moreover, 
the depth is much greater here. If a flat saw was applied, the cutting would have been deeper here and here. High-tech tools left their traces on the famous lines of mycenae. A cut made with this tool goes through the very center of the pedestal that supports the lion's forefeet. There's a picture of the digging conducted by Schleiman here in the 1870s. The cut is visible very distinctly in the old picture. It is unclear what particular tool was used. If we take into account that the cut does not reach the pedestal end, it could be made, for instance, with a circular saw. Or else it could be made with some fantastic knife. We do not have knives for stone cutting. Meanwhile, the shallow but distinct notches on the blocks of the ancient sepulcher entrance here in Mycenae suggest that such a tool was used. The notches are straight rather than curved. The latter traces are typical of an ordinary disc grinder. Millions of tourists visit the Karnak temples in Egypt every year. Virtually all of them pass through the two granite gate stands in the central walkway of the facility, in its most ancient part. The stands are covered with pictures and hieroglyphs. Egyptologists will gladly tell you what is written and depicted thereon. However, none of them takes note of the decorative vertical cuts throughout the length of the stand. These cuts could not be made with any primitive tool. The cut contour is V-shaped. In the deepest part, the cut width is less than one-tenth of a millimeter. Look at this place. This end is so thin. Its width is almost zero. Can you put your hand? It's just superb. Not only do we lack such tools, with such tiny thickness, no modern material can withstand the tool loads that occur. Even the thinnest plate diamond threads used in jewelry making now are seven times as thick. Here, we do not have the jewelry scale. The cut passes throughout the stands of five meter high gates. We have the impression that the ancient craftsman made the cut in a single movement. Where his hand traveled once, the cut deviated. Here's a cut. Do you see how thin it is? Look, it ends in a curve. Here's the manual movement with a disc grinder. At the end, it deviated. You cannot obtain these marks by hammering and scratching. Of course you cannot. It is unclear what particular tool was used to make the cut. The parallel notches along the cut also hint to some fantastic knife that could cut the solid Aswan granite easily. The study of these notches with a microscope proves their depth is the same in both the solid quartz crystals and the soft field spar. It's typical of machinery. The multitude of similar decorative notches suggests the craftsmen did not have any difficulty when handling the solid granite. It takes just two or three hours walk in the Karnak facility to easily count several dozens of notches. The cut goes into the stone depth there. It looks like it missed the path and passed by here. There is a cylindrical cavity the size of a barrel, a bit less than one meter in diameter, in a pylon of the granite block ceiling in Karnak. The equipment for making such holes in granite did not appear until late in the 20th century. Quartz rock sarcophagus debris is scattered around the pyramid of Amenhat II in Dashur, just in the desert. Egyptologists have an abundance of intact sarcophagi. So 
so they have not even paid attention to the debris. However, it takes very high-tech equipment to make the sarcophagus with three-edged internal angles. They cannot be made even using conventional stoneworking tools. The latter would leave rounded angles, and there are no curved lines here. Laser equipment experts assert that such internal angles can be made with a modern laser. However, the required energy equipment would occupy a couple of big rooms. Quartz crystals have melting traces after laser beam exposure, at least at the micro level. However, no melting traces are found with a microscope. The quartz grain form suggests that some very solid mechanical tool moving at a very high speed was applied here. The famous structure of Puma Punco at the Tijuana facility in modern Bolivia abounds in similar three-edged angles. Ancient craftsmen were so masterful in working the stones that we sometimes have an impression that they're not stone, but concrete cast products. However, it is not concrete, but andesite, the local granite, a very solid rock. The machinery traces that can be found on Puma Punca blocks often demonstrate it is not concrete. Some notches pass not only through the main granite material, but also through more solid dark inclusions. There's a block where a thin notch, several millimeters wide, is supplanted by a series of drilled holes in the same diameter. Different? No, almost the same. Those ones are a bit smaller. Is it the same notch we saw in the picture? Yes, it is. It's not even a notch. It's a special cavity, a cut. So many holes drilled. So many holes drilled. It's fantastic. And the holes look like they were drilled. Of course they were. Or did they pierce the holes with a needle? Such holes cannot be punched. And the matching part is over there on the ground. The matching part? There's the same stone. But it lies on the other side. The caretaker's nearby. So we can't turn the matching part over. What is described could be only done with machinery. Obviously, the Tijuanaca Indians, to whom historians attribute the creation of Puma Punco, did not and could not have such equipment. Surprising examples of worked andesite and of equally solid basalt can be seen in Ollantaytambo in modern Peru. Ancient craftsmen could easily cut the pieces of the required size off upright mountains at any height. They cut them off so that the remaining surface, turned, could be either ground smooth or even polished. Even to make a simple step, an oval rock piece was cut off. To prevent slipping on a wet stone when it rained, a mesh of cuts was carved in the step. Each cut is double and just two to three millimeters wide. Neither the Incas nor any other local Indian tribes had tools to perform such work. Up to date, and even more advanced technologies are required for it. The signs of high-tech equipment use can be found not only on stone blocks of megalithic structures, but also on small ancient artifacts. For instance, objects resembling shuttle bobbins for modern sewing machines are displayed in the Museum of Anthropology and History in Mexico City. They're even of the same size. They have the same empty cylinder in the middle and thin disks at the edges. These shuttle bobbins were found at ancient Indian burial sites. They're made of pitch stone, the volcanic glass. Pitch stone can be split easily. Its property has been used since ancient times to manufacture different tools. But it is impossible to obtain the proper shuttle bobbin shape by cleaving. It takes a turning machine with a very solid cutter to manufacture the shuttle bobbins. Mesoamerican Indians 
did not have any turning machines. They did not even have a potter's wheel. However, we can see similar shuttle bobbins made of rock crystal on the neighboring museum shelves. It takes not just a turning machine, but diamond cutters to make them. There are other objects similar to shuttle bobbins, but of greater diameter, that are on display in the Museum of Mexico's Oaxaca. There is something like a collar for some machine in the Tula Museum. All of these objects are also made of obsidian. One could not make them without a turning machine when making them. For over 10 years, participants in the expeditions arranged by the 3rd Millennium Science Development Foundation have found traces of high-tech tools on ancient objects in Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, Turkey, Greece, Peru, and Bolivia. Signs of highly developed technologies have also been discovered in Mexico, Ethiopia, Israel, Armenia, Japan, and on Easter Island. The quantity of discovered ancient items with the traces of technology comparable to, and even surpassing the modern level, is long numbered in the thousands. They are not just objects, they are facts, material and quite tangible facts. So, a highly developed civilization's existence dispute can be deemed finished. The presence of representatives of that civilization on our planet in those remote days is proven, evidenced with facts as science requires. It means ancient gods were the reality, rather than fables and fantasies of our predecessors, as historians say. Yet, the gods were not supernatural beings, but representatives of a very highly developed civilization with capabilities that exceeded those of our predecessors by far. The reality of ancient gods stripped of their mystic halos eliminates the main mythological contradiction. Ancient legends and tales resume the status of a sort of chronicle of actual events. The Chronicle turns out to be supported with quite substantial evidence, not only the existence of gods. The catastrophes, better known as the Deluge, can be found in ancient legends and tall tales of many nations. We managed to find traces of these events in a large number of countries. Even though we were not tasked with proving this objective, Traces were very obvious and simply caught the eye. It looks like the consequences of a mud flow, when mud and clay mix with stones and flow like an avalanche. Everything is covered with this rock here. Besides pure rocks, where formations are consolidated, there are many loose rocks. I can disassemble them by hand. It was a flood wave that first covered South America and then flew back to the ocean. And all such rubbish was carried away from the mountains. The rubbish was deposited here and got dry. It was in this way that the Nazca Plateau and the Papa Plateau were formed. That's why they are so flat. An even platform appeared on which pictures could be drawn. We managed to find pre-deluge objects. The pyramid of Cholula in Mexico is buried under a thick clay layer. The Ollantaytambo facility in Peru has the traces of destruction by a powerful water flow to pass through the Urubamba Valley against the current of this river. The Gebekli Tepe settlement in Turkey is covered with a thick layer of mud flow deposits. If we combine real facts information from ancient legends, and modern data of archaeology, geology, and other sciences, we can restore the picture of the global catastrophe that occurred some 12,500 years ago, down to details.
ancient Indian texts say about the War of Gods, a global conflict between representatives of a highly developed civilization in which powerful weapons, including nuclear, were used. Sumerian legends contain descriptions resembling the consequences of mass destruction weapon use. We found material evidence of the War of Gods during our South American expedition, namely traces of very powerful explosions that destroyed ancient megaliths. In the Bolivian settlement of Tijuana, noticeable shell craters with typically scattered ancient structure fragments are seen in two facilities, in Puma Punco and the Pyramid of Acapana. Similar large-scale destruction is visible in Silustani and Kingu in Peru. In the archaeological area with the fortress of Sacsayhuaman, there are fragments of a temple carved into the monolithic cliff. Huge cliff pieces weighing hundreds of tons were torn by some strong force from the base, boosted into the air, and then thrown to the ground hit and miss. The temple fragments lie on their sides or upside down. These fragments are situated near a round formation regarded by historians as Sacred Lake. During our 2007 expedition, we proposed the version that it was not a lake, but a huge shell crater from the explosion of some charge with a capacity comparable to a modern nuclear explosion. This version could be easily verified using georadar. According to our version, the lake should have had an almost horizontal foundation, and the crater a typical cup shape. Five years later, georadar surveys detected an underground cup-shaped structure of the lake. Thus, the facts confirm even those ancient legends and fables that seem absolutely fantastic at first glance. These facts indicate the modern view of ancient history should change, and rather drastically. However, the highly developed God civilization reality does not alter the picture of the past only. Its consequences are much more far-reaching. With material traces of the technologies that sometimes surpass even modern ones, there's an opportunity to restore these technologies, or at least find some equivalent. These technologies may accelerate the development of our own civilization. For instance, when creating the megalith, the god civilization even used a construction logic that differs from our approach. First of all, we prepare an even ground and even dig a construction pit. The god civilization used particular terrain features. For instance, some Egyptian pyramids rest on rocks that were just shaped as steps. The stonework of ancient structures in South America often fits into surrounding rocks. Not only do such solutions help save construction materials, but they also enhance seismic stability of a structure considerably. In the case of an earthquake, the stonework moves together with a cliff, like a single hole. We begin with grinding things to powder, from which we make bricks or concrete blocks. The god civilization used natural stone, making minimum changes to the shape of stone blocks when necessary. We pre-manufacture bricks or blocks of a structure and try to fit them together so that they make even walls. The god civilization craftsman first laid a wall and then cut its material off the finished wall, so that as to obtain even surfaces automatically. Such construction logic may seem strange to us, but it is adapted to develop other planets perfectly. There is no advantage to transferring finished structures or construction materials from planet to planet. It is more convenient to handle natural stone, the all-purpose construction material. 
By the way, this approach would be useful to us before we begin settling on other planets. It would help us save much money and resources when building in hard to get to mountain areas. We only need technologies and mobile tools to handle rocks with different parameters. The God civilization had such technologies and tools, some that we have yet to develop. The results of using these technologies can be seen, for instance, in Peruvian Ollantaytambo. Specialists in stone carving and construction can walk here like an exhibition of achievements. Yet, conventional exhibitions feature the exhibits made by humans, at least in one copy. That is to say, we can make the exhibits. And in Oyan Taitambo, there are things we cannot make, and nobody knows when we will be able to make them. However, the fact that they were made, even by another civilization, means they can be made. The fact itself can motivate researchers to studies. How to look for unknown technologies? One simple consideration can be helpful here. Any tool for processing stones, especially solid rocks, gets chewed up and worn. Small particles of the tool may get stuck in tiny stone surface irregularities. With these micro-inclusions, one can try to determine the material the tool was made of. Laboratory tests of the samples taken at ancient facilities suggest such micro-inclusions in the form of minor particles and even metal chips do remain on stone surfaces for a fairly long period of time. The chemical analysis sometimes shows such alloys that could not be obtained by primitive methods. For instance, there is a semi-worked granite boulder weighing 800 tons on a hill slope in the Asuka Park in Japan. When the boulder surface samples were analyzed, Alloy microparticles of copper, iron, nickel, and cobalt were found. The nickel and cobalt contents exceeded their typical contents in mixed natural materials. Of particular importance is the presence of cobalt that is currently used in high-tech industries, including for manufacturing of high-duty tools. Unfortunately, the micro-inclusions are very small. So far, their qualitative composition has been discovered only. Meanwhile, there's an opportunity to get down to their quantitative analysis, which may lead us to the alloys and the secrets of the gods, civilization, and metallurgy. Legends and fables of different nations hold that the gods gave metallurgy to humans. In recent years, the studies of ancient metallurgy centers have provided much proof of the fact that humans received off-the-shelf metal smelting technology. Moreover, ancient metallic artifacts sometimes contain alloys so strange that certain finds may well prove to be products of the gods themselves. Studying these products can also provide us with an insight into technological secrets of this highly developed civilization. However, the use of machinery was not the only stoneworking method of the god civilization. In our expedition, we came across signs of stone handling in its plastic state, like ordinary plasticine. Hence the term of plasticine technology appeared. For instance, there's a granite block two parts of which have noticeably different surface colors in Ollantaytambo. The upper part is as if covered with a yellow tarnish. A bit more material, by one millimeter or one and a half millimeters deep maximum, is removed from the lower part. The curious thing about this is, if you put your hand on the stone part where more material is removed, and pass your hand along the boundary of the two parts, so that your fingertips are precisely on the boundary, you move absolutely naturally. 
Your fingertips even feel the unevenness that corresponds to the slightest hand deviations in such moves. And my finger passes precisely along the boundary. I have an impression that the material was moved from the work surface with a hand. The only difference here is that we deal with the solid granite, not with plasticine. There's a calcite boulder in Sacsayhuaman near the sacred lake. There's a cut of an irregular form on it, which is similar to the one left with a knife when butter is cut, or with a palette knife in plasticine. The edge of the cut material is carved like butter and plasticine curve when cut. But in this case, the material is rather solid calcite. Here, it looks like somebody cut butter or cooling down plasticine with a hot knife. This is a pallet knife cast here. The edge bent down and curved. Some structures in Machu Picchu demonstrate handling of solid granite so skillful that we have an impression that the stone was worked in its plastic state. The idea of the plasticine technology use sometime in antiquity manifests itself in the famous Aswan stone pits in Egypt. You see, there are no traces of a mining pit. The traces must have been left, but they're nowhere. Absolutely nowhere. scooping, more solid dark incisions were cut together with the main granite rock and the obtained surface turned to be almost polished. The plasticine technology remained an attractive but still fantastic hypothesis for a very long time. In 2013, during the expedition to Easter Island, Several blocks with very strange traces were found in the stonework of a platform. It looked like someone moved a finger on soft plasticine, rather than the solid stone. Particular features of the traces are typical of work with a plastic material. In some cases, the nature of these traces enable us to reconstruct even their application procedure. Where two lines intersect, one can see that the material is displaced in the direction of the later line. The Easter Island platform eliminates all doubt. The god civilization actually mastered the technology, whereby stone, or its upper layer, was first transformed into a plastic state, then processed, and then solidified. However, we have no idea about whether the particular steps of stone softening and its subsequent solidification, nor the physical and chemical processes underlying this technology. Natural stone cannot be transformed into a plastic state by simple heating. Granite exposed to the air just burns down, and calcite decomposes. As for chemical etching, its effect is irreversible at best and the exposed stone loses its initial properties. The ideas about stone softening with modulated ultrasound or high-frequency electromagnetic impulses have become more and more popular recently. However, they need to be verified and thoroughly studied. In the mid-20th century, Bovey, a French scientist, paid attention to the fact that dead bats neither decayed nor putrefied in Egyptian pyramids, but mummified. Interested in this phenomenon, Bovey held a whole number of experiments to test the pyramid's impact on different objects. Many enthusiasts followed his example, and the term of pyramid effect is common knowledge now. It defines the pyramidal structure's impact on biological objects, physical, and chemical processes. Unfortunately, the overwhelming majority of these experiments were conducted improperly, so a whole number of investigators' claims have not been confirmed. 
we have to verify everything. However, we can state a pyramid may and does influence different processes. The nature of this impact is unknown to us. Furthermore, it does not fit into modern scientific knowledge, as it is the pyramid shape that produces the impact. Nonetheless, this impact is recorded in experiments. For instance, geophysical studies suggest pyramids increase the seismic amplitude somehow. To illustrate, the seismic noise amplitude at the top of even a small pyramid is by 10 times greater than it is at the pyramid bottom. A pyramid operates like a huge lens in this case. Polarized radiation was registered near the Giza Plateau pyramids. Obviously, this polarization is directly related to the pyramids. Experiments with semiconductor noises suggest the Egyptian pyramids produce some impact even at the atomic level. We managed to conduct a series of the simplest biological experiments. Seeds of ordinary peas were placed in a pyramid for some time and then sprouted and compared with a reference group. Studies suggested that even a very short time inside a pyramid, just for several hours, caused something like a shock to the seeds. A long time inside a pyramid led to an accelerated drying of the seeds and their significant inhibition. For instance, 15% of the seeds that had been placed in the Red Pyramid in Dashur for 12 months did not sprout at all, while all of the reference group seeds sprouted. Similar experiments were conducted in a small copy of the Great Pyramid in Fraizano, Moscow region. Of course, the built copy was much smaller than its original, but scientists were able not only to keep but also to sprout seeds in the pyramid. Research suggested the seeds inside the pyramid sprouted much sooner than in the reference pit of the same depth under the same conditions. In general, different experiments allow us to propose that a pyramid produces a direct impact on the speed of time. It goes beyond the modern scientific knowledge, but does not contradict the law of physics. The parameters of the Giza Plateau structures and the machinery traces there lead to the conclusion that the pyramids and the temples were created not by the Egyptians, as historians assure us, but by the highly developed God civilization. Therefore, certain scientific knowledge that civilization had stands behind the pyramid effect. As research suggests, that knowledge surpasses the modern scientific knowledge by far. A group of Russian scientists and businessmen has established a private research and development institute where one of the research areas is directly connected with the pyramid effect. During the theoretical research, the Institute's scientists predict the existence of hyperbolic fields that go beyond the four fundamental interactions known to physicists. The very first experiments held at the Institute proved these fields truly existed. Changes in the speed of time were recorded. To summarize, the reality of the ancient civilization not only makes us rewrite history, but also enables us to develop our technology and scientific knowledge. By studying ancient artifacts from that point of view, we can transform history from the science that just describes the past into the science that helps build the future. Whether or not we use this unique chance depends on us only.